So this is essentially like a slice of the rotation group. Also, you may have noticed that uh, I've started using uh, fancier 3D rendering software. So this was done in a Blender. This is actually the first animation I've ever made in a Blender. I think it turned out very well. Uh, this is not the only way you can take a kind of a slice of the rotation group. You can also do kind of a spherical slice. Let me show you that as well. This is another way to essentially look at a section of all the possible rotations you can do of an object sitting inside Euclidean space. I'm quite proud of this. I think it looks really nice. There's a little bit of clipping, so I didn't do a good job uh, kind of spacing out the uh, the cubes uh, as well as I could have. But you know what? I think it looks pretty nice. What I wanted to do is essentially think about all the possible ways you can rotate an object sitting inside Euclidean space. And I want to show a collection of cubes that are rotating via, you know, all possible or some selection of all possible rotations that you can do in uh, Euclidean space. There's, there's like two interesting problems here that I actually want to discuss. The first problem is kind of a basic problem, but it's, it's a little bit annoying. It's a little bit tricky when you think about it. How do you place points on a sphere so that they're kind of evenly spaced? You know, you have a sphere. This is, you know, the normal way in which we kind of think about moving along the sphere. This is the normal way in which we kind of like parameterize uh, the sphere. I'm using mathematicians notation for the angles that you use to go around a sphere because of course that's how I was trained. The angle that goes around this way, um, like going around the Z axis would be called theta. And the angle coming down from the Z axis from the North Pole to the South Pole is usually called a phi. You know, there's, there's equations for this, you know. X, Y, Z, uh, if you've covered spherical coordinates, uh, this will not be particularly surprising. You can also look it up, but X is gonna be like cosine theta, sine phi. Uh, y is gonna be uh, sine theta, sine phi. And you know, Z is gonna be sine, uh, sorry, cosine. And then, you know, basically, you know, if you set theta and phi to be like whatever angle. So for example, if you set uh, theta to be like uh, 45 degrees and phi to be 90 degrees, that's the same as, you know, coming down 90 degrees from up here and moving like 90 degrees around here. So you're essentially talking about this, uh, this point over here. If you set theta and phi to be like different values, you'll get, you'll get a neat little grid along the sphere, you know? So if you update theta in intervals and you update phi in intervals, right? You get, you know, a neat, a neat little collection of points. You have theta going up in increments, phi going up uh, in increments. But the problem is you'll get way more points like near the North Pole. And it kind of, it's not very good. <laughs> you know, as you go around the equator, you get uh, far fewer points. So these points are not uh, evenly distributed. You can ask the same problem about uh, distributing points on, uh, on in, in a disk. Well, it turns out we don't need to solve this problem because, you know, for example, a sunflower has already solved this problem. What is the sunflower doing, essentially? Well, the sunflower doesn't know uh, complex mathematics. I mean, what, what it's doing is uh, it has like a baked in algorithm, right? And this is the topic of a number file video, but I'll, I'm going to cover what they did and I'm going to start talking about different things uh, shortly. The sunflower essentially like uh, drops seeds at, you know, so it does one here, then it rotates a bit, maybe it'll drop another seed, then it rotates a bit, it drops another seed, it rotates another bit, it drops another seed and so on. And so the question is, you know, what is this angle going to be that will result in, you know, a nice distribution of seeds along the sunflower? And what we're basically gonna cheat off of this algorithm to get a nice distribution of points on our disk. Okay, so as you can imagine, using a rational number here is a bad idea. Let me, in fact, uh, show you. So for example, if you drop down a seed every like fifth of a rotation, right? It would look something like this. We'd go one, two, uh, three, four, five, and then this would repeat which is, you know, kind of a garbage distribution. This is not, uh, <laughs> this is not evenly distributing points all, all along our sphere, right? So if you pick any rational number, essentially, you're gonna get these like, you're gonna get like bands. It's not gonna look 
uh, fantastic and your points are not going to be evenly distributed along a sphere. However, if you use irrational numbers, you'll get a much better answer. So for example, let's say I drop a seed every, um, let's say root two. Root two is a rational, is a rational, is an irrational number. So let me just drop a seed every root two. Just not bad. You know what? That looks pretty good, right? Um, that's a pretty good uh, point distribution. It's a, a little weird. I mean, it looks a bit like a sunflower looks, which is nice. There is a couple of things to not like about this. Number one is um, there's a big cluster of points kind of near the center, which is trash. You know, I don't want that. I wanted my points to be evenly distributed all, all throughout uh, the circle. The second question is I just chose root two, but we should probably uh, choose an irrational number a little bit more cleverly. We should put a little bit more thought into what kind of irrational number that we pick. Let me um, try, for example, square root of 17. I mean, that's another irrational number. Hmm, not as good. Square root of 17 is irrational, just like square root of two is uh, irrational. So how do you make the decision about uh, what irrational number to pick? The idea is you want to pick an irrational number that is the most poorly approximated uh, possible, right, by a rational number. So you want to pick essentially the most irrational number. Okay, so, so let me tell you how you kind of evaluate how irrational an irrational number is. So. The way you evaluate how irrational an irrational number is, is you try to approximate it with fractions. And it turns out to, the fastest way to approximate an irrational number with fractions is to use continued fractions. With root two, it turns out you can write two as like, root two is like one plus 0.414, right? 0.414 is less than one, so you can write it as one over something. And uh, then you look at the, uh, whatever the whole part of that is, that, that turns out to be two. So it turns out root two, if you just keep doing this, is just like one like that, I believe. Hopefully I'm not messing up. And so on and, and, and so forth. So it turns out uh, if you look at the continued a fraction expansion of a number, you can essentially get the, fra the rational numbers that will be closest to this or like, or like the kind of best approximations to this. Okay, now what you really don't want here is a large number to show up. So for example, if you have an irrational number X and let's say like 2000 shows up here and it continues on and on. The problem is that means if a 2000 had to show up here, that means that everything you had up to here actually got really close to X, which means that this number, whatever it was, this is a rational number, if you just pause there, that got really close to X, which is why you needed a really large number. So in fact, the most irrational number is the one that you get if you just do like a bunch of ones going the way down. And that turns out to be the golden ratio. So, so phi, which is like 1.6 something something, is just one plus one over one plus one over one plus one over one plus one. So this is in a sense, the most irrational number because you know, it's uh, like, if you do its continued fraction expansion, uh, the fractions that you get uh, approach it very, very slowly, right? So it's gotta be the golden ratio. Okay, okay. So. Everything I've said so far was already covered in a wonderful number file video, but I just wanna make the claim to you that that is not enough. So let me switch out and use the golden ratio now. So instead of 12 over seven, I will use the golden ratio. So let's just do wonderful. We have, it's, it's a beauty, isn't it? It's an absolute beauty. And of course it looks a lot like a, you know, the, the sunflower seed pattern that you see all the time, right? It's a, it's a wonderful little pattern, it's beautiful. But my goal was to kind of evenly distribute points along a sphere. I mean, that's what I did to produce my final animation, right? Let me, but these points that I'm centering my cubes on are evenly spaced, right? There's not like a big cluster in the center and it like thins out as you go further out. So I cannot use this methodology here to put in these uh, cubes because there would be a huge jumble of cubes in the center. I want them to be evenly spaced. So how am I placing these dots at the moment, you know? So I'm essentially like, this is, this is, this is the center, right? And uh, I place a dot and then I go uh, a golden ratio turn and then I place another dot and then I go a little golden ratio turn 
I place another dot and I still wanna go out and out and out in a, in a spiral. So the question is, how fast should this uh, spiral be growing? What function of the radius should we be using? So it turns out the function that you need to use is uh, the square root of R. But, and, and first of all, let me, let me show you that this does, uh, this does indeed work. You do get exactly what you want here. So if you use the square root of the radius, you get, uh, how about that? <laughs> so this is a combination of using um, you know, the golden ratio and you, and you move out by the square root of R and that, you know, what can I say about it? It looks like a very well distributed collection of points. I hope you would agree. And whatever method I'm going to teach you will also allow you to evenly distribute points on a sphere as well. And lots of other shapes. I mean, you can, you can use this trick for like whatever you want. So this is, I mean, come on, that's a beauty, right? So this is this is uh, ten thousand points, and they're uh, you know very 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 nicely distributed on a on a sphere. So I mean, how do you how do you do this? I mean, how do you come up with these? Let's use a nice little trick from uh, probability theory. Okay, so this is uh, this trick from probability theory is called the inverse transform sample. You know, you might know that your computer uh, can produce random samples, right? If you say to your computer, hey, give me a real number between uh, zero and one, or give me like a float between zero and one, that's something your computer can do, right? That's something your computer can do, no problem. But sometimes you don't wanna mimic, you don't want a, a number between uh, zero and one, you want some other distribution, you want a, a completely different distribution. For example, what if you wanted your random sample to be distributed like a bell curve, you know? where it's more likely to get results, uh, you know, in the middle here, kind of less likely to get results uh, outward. You know, there are a lot of distributions out there. There are lots of interesting distributions out there that come up in a lot of different contexts. And so how do you take a uniform sample and turn it into whatever, whatever distribution you like is the question. This thing is called the CDF of X and uh, people usually denote it with a capital F sub x, and this contains, this function will tell you information about uh, x, essentially, right? So, you know, uh, this function will tell you information about uh, what the probability x has of attaining certain values, and it encodes the information as follows. So the way this function encodes this information is the probability that capital X is less than some, some value a is equal to f sub x evaluated at a. So, so this is the probability that capital X is less than a. So for example, if this function evaluated at uh, seven is like uh, 0.9, then this is just saying that the probability that X is less than seven is 0.9. Make sense? So it's just like a nifty, clean little way to encode uh, probabilistic information inside a function, you know, about some random variable, essentially. Now, the question is, you would like to come up with a transformation. So your computer generates uniform random information. You would like it to generate uh, random numbers based on some distribution that uh, X has, right? How do you do this? Well, you would like to transform U in some way so that it 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 does random things like X does. So you know your computer gives you U, you throw it in some function T, and that's what you would like. Well, let's think about it for a second. We, if we've come up with the right T, then T of U should behave just like X behaves, right? So once again, this is the cumulative distribution of uh, x is this nice function. It just tells you what's the probability that x is less than or equal to some value a. Well, if I've done a good job coming up with, with my t, then this should be the same as the probability that t of u is less than or equal to a, right? If t of u behaves just like x behaves, then these two probabilities really ought to be the same, right? But of course this means, uh, you know, the probability this is, should be the same as the probability that u is less than or equal to t inverse of a. Now, this is, of course, assuming that t is invertible, but let's, um, you know, <laughs> let's stick with this for the moment. Okay. Now, 
U is, let's say, a uniform random variable. So it's, it's like your computer's uh, power to generate a random real number between zero and uh, one, right? So this is your computer's power to generate a, ra uh, a, a random number that's between zero and one. So what's the probability that U is less than some number? It should just be that number, right? For example, if your computer generates a random number between zero and one, what's the probability that that number is less than 0.7? Well, 0.7, it's a random, it's a uniform random number between between zero and one. So it turns out this is just equal to T inverse of A. So, aha, our cumulative distribution of A should equal our inverse transform of A, which means our transformation is actually just the inverse of the CDF. How about that? Isn't that interesting? So if you would like to turn your computer's uniform random noise into whatever style of noise, just figure out what the cumulative distribution uh, function is for the style of random noise you would like to generate and just take your uniform noise and apply F inverse X to that. So this is called um, the, this is called the, this is the, this is called the inverse transform sample. So I'm going to fast forward through all of the uh, CDF computations simply because I'd like to keep this edit under 20 minutes. Sorry about that. Enjoy. So the CDF, our transformation, turned out to be R squared. So the inverse of it turns out to be the square root of R. And that's where that square root of R is uh, coming from. Let's now do this for a sphere. So this is the function we are after. This is the function. What is the inverse of this function? The inverse of this function would be like, if you plug this in for phi and then do in spherical coordinates, if you plug in this value for phi and for theta you do the golden ratio thing, you get this. Isn't that nice? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Oh, okay, so at this point in the stream I started talking about the rotation group in uh, Euclidean three space. And I just couldn't stop talking about it. I wound up waffling for 30 minutes. Uh, I don't really know how to edit it down. So here is a montage of me talking about the special orthogonal group of order three. Enjoy. Scripted this in, in, in Blender with those three vectors. You know, the first vector becomes the first column of the matrix. The second vector becomes the second column of the matrix. Yeah, so just so you can see, like you can see all these different rotations kind of acting on. Uh, when that happens, you're, you're in a situation called a, a gimbal lock. Every point in R3 specifies a vector and the length of that vector can specify the angle of rotation. That's why the rotation just doesn't look uh, as intuitive as in thinking about the geometry of SO3 and you were actually trying to get it in your head. You know, you're actually trying to think about it. These two points ought to be the same point took a pair of scissors and you cut out a central disc, you would actually get a, a Mobius strip <laughs> with self-intersection, but it should not be drawn with the self-intersection. I mean, yeah, I'll be streaming again on Saturday at 1 p.m. your week. All right, bye-bye, peace.